Today on The Grave Talks, The Allen House. When Mark Spencer and his family moved into the beautiful old Allen House in Monticello, Arkansas, they were well aware of its notorious reputation for being haunted. According to local lore, the troubled spirit of society belle Liddell Allen, who had mysteriously committed suicide in the master bedroom in the year 1948, still roamed the grand historic mansion. Yet, Mark remained skeptical until he and his family began encountering faceless phantoms, a doppelganger spirit, and other paranormal phenomena Ensuing ghost investigations offered convincing evidence that six spirits, including Liddell, inhabited their home. But the most shocking event occurred the day Mark followed a strange urge to explore the attic and found crammed under a floorboard secret love letters that touchingly depicted Liddell Allen's forbidden, heart-searing romance and shed light on her tragic end. This discovery and this story is what we'll be talking about today on The Grave Talks. My wife and I drove to Monticello, Arkansas because I was offered an interview for the position of of Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities at the University of Arkansas at Monticello. And we drove into town on the the main highway. We... um, Took a took a left turn at a at a light. We drove up to the town square. We took a left turn at the town square, and we found ourselves on North Main Street. And we drove down North Main Street, admiring the large old historic homes. And we came upon this um, somewhat rundown, but but really gorgeous old Victorian. And I stopped the car. And my wife and I sat there in the middle of the street gawking at this house because it, it was just so so attractive to us. And my wife said to me, if you buy me that house, you can take the job. And and I said, I, it doesn't look like the house was for sale, though. And she said, I don't care. <laughs> you know? And that was kind of her condition. Um, but uh, that that house, of course, turned out to be the Allen House. Um, I'd never heard of the Allen House. Uh, I we we just happened upon it, and um, I ended up taking the the job here in Monticello, and uh, we we ended up moving to town, and we would frequently drive by the Allen House. Um, I, I had done a little bit of research. One day I just Googled Allen House, Monticello, Arkansas, and I was surprised that all these websites came up, and they were all about paranormal activity. And that, that took me a little off guard. I wasn't expecting that. But there are all these websites that featured narratives about the Allen House and told of the various ghost stories and paranormal activity that supposedly had been going on since the mid 20th century. And that's that's when I initially learned about the Allen House. I didn't really take any of the stories seriously, though I, I thought they were largely the products of overactive imaginations. Um, it seemed like it was a good house to be the town's haunted house because of the way it looked for one thing, and, and also there was the historic fact of a, of a suicide connected with the house. When your wife first heard about these paranormal occurrences and these stories about the house, what was her reaction? Oh, she didn't, she didn't care. Um, she, <laughs> she, she didn't care about the paranormal stories, the ghost stories. She, she thought it was kind of interesting, but neither one of us was put off by the stories, mainly because we didn't take them seriously. We thought, well, you know, it's a small town in the South. Every small town in the South has a haunted house. And 
yeah, as I said, um, if you're going to have a haunted house in Monticello, the Allen House was naturally the one to have because it it looked like a haunted house when we first saw it because the yard was all grown up and the house was kind of run down, needed painting. Um, so it looked kind of creepy. Um, and, and there was the historical fact, as I said, of a, of a suicide connected with the house. Um, but, but no, my wife and I didn't didn't really, you know, take the story seriously. How did you go about the process of coming into possession of the Allen House? After shortly after we moved to town, we visited a real estate office, um, talked to a real estate agent. Um, just went in and, and said, um, the, we're interested in this house. We just moved here. We're interested in a particular house on North Main Street. It, there, there's not a sign in front of it. Um, there's no indication that the house is for sale, but we really liked the house, and we were wondering whether um, we could ask a real estate agent to approach the owner and see whether the owner would be interested in selling. And when the real estate agent learned that we were interested in the Allen house, she said she wouldn't do it. <laughs> she just said, oh, you don't want to buy that house. And, and my wife and I were just stunned. It was like we, we had moved to a town where real estate agents didn't have any interest in earning commissions. <laughs> it seemed it's like, but, you know, and, and it wasn't like, oh, well, I know the woman who who owns that house and she loves it too much to ever sell it. It wasn't anything like that. She just said, well, that house has a history. You don't want it. <laughs> and, and, and so my wife and I had left the real estate office kind of baffled and decided that we would just go to the house um, and, and approach the owner ourselves. And how did that go? And, and so shortly after that, we, we went to the house, pulled up in the driveway, and um, I, I went up on the porch and, and rang the doorbell, and it was all kind of creepy because it was all kind of run down, as I said, and and there was a, a radio on it. We, we subsequently learned that the owner of the house left a radio on whenever she left the house, when she um, um, went traveling. She would leave a radio on, and she would leave it on very loud, and she would leave it on an evangelical radio station, 24-hour fire and brimstone evangelical radio station. And so I go on the porch of this house, and there are cobwebs in the corner <laughs> of the of the porch roof and, and there's paint peeling off and the floorboards of the of the porch are, are all creaky and there's this voice emanating from the house shouting about hell. <laughs> you know you're all going to hell. <laughs> you know and and it sounded you know kinda of like a radio and it, it the voice had the the tone of, of a radio broadcast, so I, I didn't think it was really a person shouting, but still, it was kind of creepy. And I, I rang the doorbell and waited for a couple of minutes, and nobody answered, so I decided I'd spend enough time <laughs> standing there in the porch. And, and when I got in the car, I, I said to my wife, you know, this place is awfully run down. Maybe we ought to think about <laughs> looking at something else. Um, and and she said, no, I just really like this house. I think this house needs us. And I said, really? <laughs> you know, and and then um, I I guess I sat there and, and looked at the house for a couple of minutes, and I decided, okay, well, I kind of see what you mean. Yeah, it is. A, you know, such an interesting looking house. Um, we started telling people in town, new friends and acquaintances, that we were really interested in the Victorian the large Victorian house on North Main Street and and people said, Oh yeah, that's the Allen House and it was and everybody knew the house and, and they knew it as the Allen House. Um Joe Lee Allen was the original owner of the house. It was in the Allen family for eighty years from nineteen oh six to nineteen eighty six. And um and people who had lived in town for a while all told us that we didn't want the house. They, they said, well, you don't want to buy that house. And I would say, well, why not? And they'd say, well, because it's haunted. <laughs> and, and I'd say, oh, oh really? <laughs> I just, 
I, I found it all rather amusing, actually, that people were telling me not to buy the house because it was haunted. And, uh, and then one day, the owner of the house called me at work here at my office at the university. And she said, I understand you want to buy my house. You know, this is a small town, so word gets around. <laughs> You know, um, somebody had told the owner of the Allen House that there were these new people in town. <laughs> this new dean at the university and his wife who were, you know, who were coveting her house, and and so and so we had not managed to get hold of the owner. It ended up she got hold of us. She called and and. And I said, well, would you be interested in, in selling your house? And she said, I might if I like you. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, well, what do we need to do <laughs> uh, for you to find out whether you like us? And she said, well, you need to come over to the house sometime. And she said she was about to um, leave on another trip. She spent a lot of time away from the house. She traveled quite a bit. And so we set up a time to, to see the house all in two or three weeks from from that point and um and so we we'd gotten into the habit of driving by the house a lot because we we enjoyed just looking at it and finally we we um we got to see the inside of the house um the the evening of our appointment with the owner arrived and and she ushered us into the house and and showed us around and um, it, it was interesting. The, the woman was a hoarder, um, <laughs> and she so there was a lot of stuff in the house. But she wasn't. But she wasn't like the the hoarders you see in the TV shows who have five hundred thousand empty milk cartons in their living room. <laughs> she was a rich hoarder, <laughs> and so she had really nice things. Um, she had all this nice furniture and mirrors and and, and artworks. Uh, just everything just jam packed floor to ceiling and with paths going through the rooms and um and so we could kind of get a sense of of what the inside of the house looked like, although it wasn't that easy um uh, and she she took us upstairs to the master bedroom. And and what was interesting about that, it was a, a couple of nights before we had driven by and we'd stopped in front of the house and we were looking at it, and we had all seen a, a woman sitting in the in the window, um, second story turret window, which is where the master bedroom is. And one one of the kids, one of our kids, had pointed the the, the woman out first. Said, "Look, there's a lady in the window." And we all looked, and you know, it's my wife and three kids, and we're all saying, "Yeah, there's a lady in the window." <laughs> you know, and it looked like she was maybe sitting at a at a at a little table or desk, maybe reading or or, or writing, um, and had a little lamp on next to her. That that's what we all saw. And um, and my wife even said, you know, we probably shouldn't sit here gawking like this. She'll think we're stalking her. And and so we, we drove away. And then that night, we got to see the inside of the house. The owner took us up to that master bedroom, and she opened the door, and she immediately apologized for our not being able to step inside the room because the room was packed full of boxes and furniture. She used the the master bedroom exclusively for for storage, and I said, um, "But but we saw you in the in the window the other night," and she said, "She said no, I wasn't even here the other night." And besides, as you can see, you can't even get to the window. And and I said, "Oh, okay." And I'm looking around. I'm trying to think. Well, okay. Well, maybe it was a different room, you know. And I said, "Oh, okay." And I was about to just just let it go. And and then the owner said, have people been telling you that the house is haunted? And I said, yeah, I've heard those stories. And she said, well, it is. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and I, I just kind of went along, you know, I, I'm thinking, okay, well, this lady's kind of, kind of nutty, you know, but I'm being polite to her because I'm interested in buying her house. And then she started telling me and my wife stories about her experiences when she first moved into the house, things about the ghost talking to her and 
and and her having to tell him to leave her alone. <laughs> and, um, and so that that was interesting. But she made it, made no bones about it. She wanted to be very open about the fact that the house was haunted. But but my wife and I still didn't take any of that seriously. What was the emotional state of the woman who was inhabiting the house when she was talking about the ghost? Did she seem to be at peace with them? Do was it a tormenting situation? What was what was the vibe you were getting from her at that time? I, my my sense was that she was accustomed to the um, paranormal activity that she was perceiving or believed that she perceived. Um, she she didn't seem to be bothered by it. She didn't seem threatened at all by the spirits. But she was um, adamant that the house did contain spirits and that they generally left her alone, and that when they started talking to her, she just told them to shut up. Now that you had a chance to get in there, you had a chance to to not only see the house from the outside, but now the inside, and you're realizing this is a hoarding-type situation, maybe a little bit more work than we were anticipating. Uh, what, what happened after that? Was there any hesitation uh, as you continued down the path of interest in this house? Yeah, well, for some reason, she she did like us. In fact, she she said that she had a feeling that we were meant to have the house, that she had never thought about selling the house before, that she had always told people she would let the house fall into the ground um, before she would sell it, or she would dismantle it and move it to Dallas. That that was one of her her, her plans. She said at at one point, but she said that she just loved the house and and she couldn't imagine selling it. But now she could imagine selling it, and and of course I'm thinking, okay, lady, how much are you gonna want for this place? I thought she was setting me up for asking some enormous price for the house. Sure. Um, but but she wasn't. She she was delighted that we had a daughter, and she she said, "Oh, it would be so wonderful for a little girl to live in this house." And this lady lived there by herself. Um, she said, "Oh, it'd be so. It would make a little girl feel like a princess." And and I think she liked that idea. She liked the idea that we had small children. Um, and and so finally, I said, "Well, you know, it seems like she's building this up, and you know." And then she's going to want, you know, $2.5 million or something for this place. And and finally, I said, well, how much do you do you want for the house if, if you're willing to sell it? And um, and she she named the price and it really wasn't bad at all. She she said that she would sell the house for one hundred and eighty five thousand dollars. And this is a house with eight thousand square feet. So even in a small town, (laughs) I mean, uh, you would expect to pay more than that. When that happened, did you just jump at at the opportunity now to get this home that you were so intrigued with? Yeah, I um, I wrote her a check for for $8,000 as as earnest money, and we did a contract and... Um, and, and we were excited about it. My wife and I knew that the house needed work, needed a good bit of work, in fact. But we just really had fallen in love with the architecture of the house. We just thought it was a gorgeous house inside and out. It was it was a unique house. Um, you, you've probably seen photographs of the house. It's a somewhat unique blend of neoclassical and Queen Anne and Gothic architecture. Yeah, very much so. And and the inside of the house was very interesting. Every room was a different shape. The moldings, the windows were all different in every room. You know, had all that character that um, Victorian houses often have, especially if if they were built for for people with money back during that period of time. And and that was the case because the uh, the, the man who had the house built was the wealthiest entrepreneur in Monticello. How did the process of obtaining the home go? Was it a smooth process with someone like that? Well, it was interesting. She after we signed the contract, she kept um canceling the closing. 
She canceled the closing. I think ultimately she canceled the closing eight times. We would set up a closing date, yeah. and then she would cancel it. She always had she was sick, or 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 she 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 wasn't ready to move yet. She had too much to pack. She didn't have enough help. <laughs> to to pack all of her things, it was it was always something. She either either she was sick, she was having complications, or she was just not ready to move yet. And this went on for about a year. And in fact, we we went ahead and bought another house. <laughs> And in the meantime, because we were li- living in a rental house and 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 we we weren't very comfortable in the rental house. And so we ended up buying another old um, historical home um, a few blocks away, which turned out to be the home of the architect who designed the Allen House. We didn't know that when we when we first bought the house, but it, it turned out to be an inter- interesting coincidence that we had purchased the home of the architect who had designed the Allen House. And, and we moved into that house um, knowing that this woman we had contracted with was kind of flaky <laughs> and we really couldn't um, predict when, if ever, we would actually get to move into the Allen house. My my wife even um, insisted that we go to a couple of attorneys <laughs> um, to, to see whether we could force this woman to follow through with the the um, the contract that we had signed her in the house sure. because my wife was getting so impatient, um, and and so this went on for another year. So we were we had lived in Monticello for a couple of years, and and we had had a contractor in the house for a couple of years before we actually moved into it. The woman at one point had a big auction had had hired an auction company to to clean out most of the things in her house and so at one point about halfway through this process about around the end of year one in the context of this process she she sold most of the contents of her house but she was addicted to shopping and by the time she actually did move out she had filled the house back up and she had to hire four of the largest moving vans to to move her things out of the house. But the adventure in moving into the home you so wanted to get into didn't end there. Well, we closed, and and then she stayed in the house, <laughs> and and we had we had put the utilities in our own name, <laughs> you know, and so we were paying the the electric bill. And she was sitting in the house running the air conditioning, and and I would go over, and my wife just couldn't deal with this woman anymore. So my wife never had any more contact with her. I told my wife, I said, you know, you, you need to just stay away from her because I'll have to come visit you in prison, <laughs> you know, if you don't. Uh, and and so I would go over and and see the the seller. And, and, you know, we would talk about things. I said, well, you know, uh, you know, we closed in the house and, you know, like the house is actually ours now. <laughs> you know, it's like, so, so when, when do you think you can actually be out? <laughs> and, and, and finally I got her to sign a piece of paper promising that she would actually, that she would be out by midnight on a certain day. And when that day arrived, my wife insisted that we be sitting in the front yard with a truck full of furniture at midnight. <laughs> and that woman was still in the house at 11.59. <laughs> and at midnight, my wife started carrying things in. And the woman went out the back door as my wife was literally walking in the front door carrying a chair. <laughs> Whatever happened and then, with it. Okay, continue on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then what we heard from, from people in town was that she and her four moving vans stayed at a motel on the edge of town for two and a half weeks because she just didn't know what to do with herself. So she had, so there were these moving vans parked 
in the parking lot of of a motel where she stayed because she just she had suddenly fallen ill and it was a sort of emotional illness and she couldn't believe that we had kicked her out of her house <laughs> and, and and it took her two and a half weeks and her her ex-husband came and, and got her and and moved her in with him or the gulf coast of, in texas once that adventure in home sales had come to a conclusion and it was in fact finally yours and there was no one squatting in the house what ensued well it, it was um it's really pretty exciting but but one of the things that we had become aware of after this this woman got all, all of her stuff out was that the house inside was in pretty bad shape uh, it didn't look so bad when she had all of her glittery expensive items stacked up floor to ceiling but once she got everything out uh, we could discern that the the walls were in bad shape the wall you know everything needed to be wallpapered or painted um, she took all the light fixtures <laughs> there weren't any light fixtures or chandeliers um, except for the original chandelier in the dining room which she, I'm sure which is huge and, and I think she just wasn't capable of <laughs> dismantling or finding anybody who who could um, so so things were pretty pretty rough inside I, my wife's sister and, and brother-in-law came to visit us about 10 days after we moved in and the first thing her brother-in-law said when he walked into the house was how long was this place abandoned and that gives you some idea of what it looked like and, yeah. and so it but but we were really excited about being in the house and we immediately started working on it and I I come home from work every evening and, and do some, some painting or, or, you know, some kind of repair work. I, and, and my wife, you know, did what she could during the day. And, and we, you know, hired people to do things that we weren't capable of doing. What was the first moment you realized maybe there is something to these stories that I had been hearing about prior to taking possession of this home? Um, well, it was quite a while before I really started thinking maybe there really was something. I was pretty good at denying things or rationalizing things. But the day we moved in, this was the the, the actual, in, in the daylight, you know, we moved a few things in at midnight and, and, and made sure the woman was gone. And then we locked the house up and, and went back to our other house and slept for a while. But but then we we got up and we started moving things in in earnest. And um, that day, I was carrying some boxes in through the side door. And there's a staircase. There's a, a side staircase as well as the front staircase, what they call the grand staircase in the front of the house. But this was at the side staircase. I was I was carrying these boxes in the side door, and my my son, who was five at the time was was just standing there by that staircase as I was carrying these boxes in and and I immediately discerned that he maybe didn't feel well or something. He didn't look right. He he looked pale and he was just standing there and uh, I was juggling these boxes and I I turn away from him and I say over my shoulder, Well how do you like your new house? And he doesn't say anything and I get the boxes situated and I turn back and he wasn't there anymore. He was just gone. And I thought, well, I, I didn't think too much of it. And then uh, a little while later, I went upstairs, and he was upstairs watching a, a movie, I think a Star Wars movie or something. And I said, said were you feeling okay? And he said, well, you, well, well yeah, what, what do you mean? And I said, well, uh, yeah, you were standing downstairs by the staircase a little while ago, and, and you just standing there, you didn't say anything. And he said, well, what are you talking about? I haven't been downstairs. <laughs> And I said, well, yeah, about a half hour ago. You were right downstairs. And he said, no, no, I haven't been downstairs in hours. I've been watching all these Star Wars movies. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. Um, that was a little bit odd, but I didn't think too much about it. And and then there was a pattern uh, um, of things those first few days. Um, a couple of days later, I was in the kitchen with, with my, my son, again, you know, a five-year-old. And 
And my wife came down into the kitchen from upstairs, and she looked at, at our son, Jacob, and said, how did you get down here so quickly? And, and I said to her, what, what do you mean? He's been down here with me for about 20 minutes. And she said, no, he was just upstairs in the hallway. And, you know, and I said, oh, no, he's been down here with me. <laughs> and she said, no, just a few seconds ago. And I said, no. And then, and then she said, oh, my God. <laughs> and, and then she proceeded to tell me about an incident the day before when she was um, working, unpacking some boxes in the front entrance of the house. And there's a, there's a, a bathroom just off the front entrance. And she said that she had seen Jacob go into that bathroom and he closed the door and he never came out. And she said after a while, she started worrying about him. So she went to the bathroom door and she knocked on it and didn't get an answer. She opened the door and nobody was in there. And then a few minutes later, she went upstairs and found Jacob and asked him whether he was okay. And he said, well, why? And said, well, because he went into the bathroom downstairs. And, and you were in there for a long time, and and he said, I haven't been down to that bathroom. And then he, he and he added, I don't go in that bathroom. That's it. It creeps me out. <laughs> and and so there was this 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 pattern of things. Um, a, a friend of my wife came over and was was helping her um, bring some some things into the house. My wife was in the back of the house in in the kitchen um, and she kept hearing her friend coming in the front door and putting things down in the entrance um, and then finally her friend came back to the kitchen and said said well why why wouldn't you answer me? Why didn't you help me?" And my wife said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, I kept, I, I, you were standing in the library just off the entrance, and, and I kept asking you to come and help me with this, this big thing, and, and you just stood there. And my wife said, I've been back here the whole time. I haven't been in the library. And, and her friend just said, okay, well, I'm leaving. I'm not coming back here. <laughs> but it was... It was this whole pattern of things, and as I said, I was pretty good at rationalizing things. I really didn't. I I just didn't give it a whole lot of thought. But the fact is, we were seeing people where these people claimed they were not. Mm -hmm. You know, the incidents with our son Jacob, and then the incident with with my wife. And there was another incident with my wife where um, a friend came to the front door, and my wife opened the front door immediately. And 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 the friend said, "How did you get to the door so quickly?" And my wife said, "Well, I was I was standing right here." And she said, "No, when I was walking up to the house, you were upstairs, looking out the window." <laughs> and and my wife said, "No, I wasn't upstairs. I've been right here." And and so later, when we we started talking to paranormal investigators. And, and telling them about these these early incidents, the paranormal investigators explained to us that what likely we had experienced was doppelganger activity, mm -hmm. um, where a, a spirit, an entity, is is using energy from a living person in the vicinity to manifest itself. And I guess it makes sort of sense that if the entity is using that living person's energy, that the entity would perhaps take on an appearance that's similar to the living person. But, but that was the, the explanation. I fully understand trying to, to rationalize uh, situations like this where they're very, very troubling. They're out of the ordinary. They completely make you question a belief system. It's not an easy thing just to, to jump into and, and, and be okay with but you got into great detail of what you saw it wasn't just uh, maybe out of the corner of my eye you you just described very very intricate details of the experience that you had I, I just thought well you know something you know we're, we're just you know we 
we have good imaginations. We're just thinking <laughs> we see these things. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, one, one day, we hadn't lived in the house too long. And my wife, I, I was in the master bedroom sitting on, on love seat reading a book, I think. And my wife came in and, and with this kind of stunned look on her face. And I, I asked her, well, what, what's wrong? And she said, there's, there's a man out in the hall. And I said, there's a man out in the hall? And she said, yeah. I said, well, who is he? And she said, I'm not sure, but I think it might be Jolie Allen. <laughs> I just went, well, okay, my wife's gone totally nuts now. Um, and, and she explained that she had seen this um, this man, it, very distinctly the figure of a man, but it was sort of a shadow figure. It was it was a dark figure, um, but it was very distinctly in her mind the figure of a man. What continued to transpire after that point, and did you get any sort of sense or identification of who it might be that's inhabiting the house from the other side? Well, we were um, we were bombarded with requests from paranormal investigators when we first moved into the house. I mean, immediately, as soon as we moved into the house, the first week we were in the house, I think my wife received probably 20 phone calls and and emails from paranormal investigators, all wanting to come and do investigations in the house, because the house had had a reputation for paranormal activity for a long time, for decades. And it had been written up on all these websites. It had been written up in books going back, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, and my wife and I said no to all these requests. Uh, we, we didn't want to get into it. We, we weren't really particularly interested in having paranormal investigators. We, we, we didn't really didn't want to open our home up to strangers coming in and doing paranormal investigations. Not that we, we were afraid of them or anything. Um, and, and we had even watched some episodes of Ghost Hunters and, and thought it was all interesting. But we were, we were focused on just fixing up the house and making it our home. Um, and, and, and we, we were just kind of shy about, you know, getting into the whole paranormal investigative thing. But after we had been in the house for not quite a year, we were approached by a group from Louisiana called Louisiana Spirits. And they were a branch of TAPS, which is connected with the Ghost Hunters, um, TV show, um, group. And, and they seemed, rather down-to-earth, pragmatic people. They, they explained to us that they were primarily interested in debunking stories of the paranormal, that they approached the investigations as scientifically as was possible, and that in 99% of the cases, they found absolutely no evidence of any kind of paranormal activity, and in the 1% of cases, they they found they they might find something they couldn't explain, but that didn't necessarily mean you know that there was something paranormal going on. It just meant that it was something they they couldn't explain, and and they didn't put any stock in subjective experiences. They didn't use psychics. A lot of these groups that contacted us, they wanted to come in a house with psychics, or they wanted to do seances and that sort of thing. And and, and we just I oh, don't think so. Uh, but but this group, Louisiana Spirits, they, they seemed okay. And, and I think we had been in the house long enough, and 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 we decided that it would be interesting. It, it would be interesting to be able to say that we had a paranormal investigation. And I honestly thought that maybe. Um, these investigators would be able to come up with some explanations for things um, because I had I had heard that there could be all sorts of reasons why people heard things and and, and saw things. I mean, you could have um, electrical issues in your house, especially in an old house. Uh, there could be toxic gases coming up from the ground. Um, you could be living too close to a um, a power station or something. I mean, I, I, I'd heard these. And, and of course, old houses, they, they have all these these angles and, and, and lights and shadows can, can play tricks on your eyes. And of course, they're creaky, so you, you, know, you're, you hear things and, and the way sounds bounce off walls and all can be provocative. 
Um, but so so I thought, yeah, let's let's have a paranormal investigation. And so it was in June of 2008 that we let LA Spirits come in. And uh, we didn't know what the protocol was for having paranormal investigators in our house. And so my wife and I planned, the, the kids were visiting friends for the night, and my wife and I decided we'd go out to dinner and then go to a movie, you know, and just stay away from the house, let the investigators do whatever they needed to do. And they, they came and they were setting up all their equipment, and they were about, about done setting up their equipment when my wife and I left the house. And I remember distinctly um, going down the staircase and kind of shouting back up to the second floor to them, saying, we're, we're, we're leaving now, the house is all yours. And, and, and feeling something strange in the air, like an electrical charge or something in the air when I said that. And my wife and I got in the car and we, we drove down the street just a, a little bit. Uh, we were not more than about a half a minute away from the house when her cell phone rang and it was the lead investigator um, saying that we needed to come back to the house because um, just as they were beginning their investigation, um, just as the lead investigator was literally saying, okay, let's start lights out, um, there was an explosion in the backyard and all the electricity went out. It turned out that a tree limb had fallen on the power line and, and torn the meter off the house. And this is all. This has happened just as they were about to begin their investigation. Now this is a warm summer night. It's not raining. The wind's not blowing. the The tree was all green and leafy and seemed perfectly healthy. Uh, but this branch that just happened to be over the power line just broke off and fell on the power line. And I'm thinking, wow, this is really fascinating. We have a story. You know, I'm I'm not thinking that this is paranormal. I'm just thinking it's a great coincidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, in any case, uh, they they weren't able to to do their investigation that night. Not any kind of complete investigation, but they did um, have some battery operated audio recorders that they had already turned on. And a couple of days after this um, aborted investigation, um, the lead investigator called me and he said, "I'm going to email you um, this file." because we recorded an EVP, electronic voice phenomena. And he sent me this, this, um, this EVP, what he was calling an EVP, and, and on the recording, you could hear the voices of the investigators. This is right after the, um, the electricity goes off, and you could hear one of the investigators um, saying, saying something about... Uh, all about an explosion in the backyard, um, and and somebody saying, "Well, this is this is quite a coincidence." Um, and then this other voice came in, a woman's voice, um, a soft voice, and 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 one of the investigators had said, "I think a transformer blew," and this this new voice this woman's voice says not a transformer and then she said it and then she repeated it not a transformer not a transformer um, and and the investigators are saying that voice was not one of the investigators that was somebody else and I thought, well, that's interesting. I didn't necessarily believe it, <laughs> yeah, but I thought it was interesting. In any case, LA Spirits wanted to um, come back and, and try again to do an investigation. So about three weeks later, they, they came to the house. And my wife said we weren't leaving. She didn't want anything else broken, she said. Um, so we stayed and, and we sat with the investigators and we observed um, their investigation throughout the evening. And they were able to do a full investigation without incident. And then uh, a couple weeks after that, they came back to the house for the reveal. And the lead investigator 
sat at the dining room table with me and he said, well, do you want to ask me what homeowners always want to ask? And I said, well, well, what's that? And he said, well, do you want to ask me whether your house is haunted? I said, okay. Was my house haunted? He said, yes, definitely. And, and then he proceeded to play over 40 EVPs that they had recorded. And, and half of these, at least 20 of the EVPs, were very distinct, what they called Category A EVPs. Uh, and, and I remember just sitting there and, and getting a, a shiver up my spine, <laughs> you know, listening to these voices and saying, well, well where do these voices come from? Who are these people? And, and, some, you know, and there was a, a female voice that kind of dominated. About 70% of these EVPs were the same female voice. And then there were some children's voices. And there was a voice that sounded like an older woman, a voice that sounded like an older man, a voice that sounded like a young man. So there were at least five or six voices, different voices, distinctly different voices that we were hearing on these recordings. And and I'm starting to think, well, maybe there's something to these ghost stories. <laughs> so I'm starting to think, maybe we're not alone. Nonetheless, there was still a part of my mind that was skeptical. I, I was still not quite ready to, to embrace this idea of, of ghosts in the house, um, not 100%. So... Uh, it wasn't too long after that, maybe a week or two later, one evening, um, I went up to the attic by myself with a digital audio recorder, like a $10 recorder, and I decided I was going to have my own EVP session by myself in the attic. And I sat there for a few minutes, and, and I felt a little bit odd, at, you know, talking to Liddell Allen. Liddell Allen's the one who committed suicide in, in the house. And um, and I didn't have a really good attention span for that kind of of work, as it were. Um, and so um, I decided to, after not too long, to to play back anything I had recorded. And in the recording was this woman's voice responding to my question about whether she liked being there at the house. And she had very distinctly and very clearly answered my question as if she had been sitting next to me in the attic. And I knew I was in the attic by myself. Um, I knew I hadn't faked that EVP. And that was the evening that I became a believer. I became convinced that, yeah, there there were ghosts in the house because how else did that woman's voice get on there and and it was very clearly a response to the question it was an an instance of an intelligent haunting that 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 in direct interaction between an an, an entity and, and a living person prior to this moment did you have any inkling personally that there was something going on in, in your belief system or did you just not believe that the ghosts existed at all and there was a rational explanation for anything odd that might be occurring i don't think i believed in ghosts at all i was i was just very skeptical sure yeah you know, I, I grew up at a time when people just didn't believe in ghosts you know if, if you know you talked about seeing ghosts or something everybody thought you were crazy yeah, that was my generation. Uh, n nowadays, it seems, you know, people are a lot more accepting of the idea of, of ghosts and spirits and paranormal activity. And, and, you know, gosh, I meet people all the time. And I, I, you know, I meet people at the university, you know, very well educated, you know, highly respected, prominent citizens who tell me their own ghost stories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but 30, 40 years ago, None of us would have gone around talking about our ghost stories because we'd be afraid of being called crazy. Now, this house obviously has a ghost in it that has a very interesting past, a very uh, almost novel-like history. Liddell Allen, can you tell me her story? Yeah. Liddell Allen Bonner was the, the middle daughter of the Allens, Joe Lee and Caddy Allen. Um, they they had had three daughters. Lonnie 
Liddell and Louie. And as I said, Liddell was the middle daughter. Um, Liddell was the, the pretty daughter um, and, and the favored daughter of Joe Lee. Joe Lee named a town after her. In fact, there's a town called Liddell, Arkansas, not too far from Monticello. Uh, he was the chief investor in, in the community of Liddell in 1912. And since he was the money man, he got to name the, the town, and he named it after his middle daughter. Um, Christmas night, 1948, Liddell's mother, Caddy, was having her, hosting her annual Christmas party. Every Christmas night, uh, the night of the 25th of December, Caddy would, would host a Christmas party at, at the house. And Liddell was, was living at the house with, with her mother. Um, and Liddell attended the party downstairs on the first floor. She mingled with the guest until late in the evening when she prepared herself a plate of hors d'oeuvres and a glass of punch. And, 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 the, and I've, I've talked to a lot of people and, and done a lot of historical research, and, and this is something that's very consistent. The, you know, the story of the party, you know, there really was a party. And, you know, um, Liddell really was interacting with the guest. She did prepare herself to a glass of punch and the plate of hors d'oeuvres late in the evening and she went up to the master bedroom and she used the the punch and the hors d'oeuvres apparently to mask the taste of mercury cyanide tablets um, everybody in the community was shocked you know why would Liddell do this for one thing Liddell had a reputation for for being um, very loving and optimistic and cheerful if you were depressed about something and you wanted somebody to cheer you up you would go see Liddell Allen because she would surely cheer you up and make you feel that life was worth living so that was one of the really poignant ironies of her suicide um, and and as I indicated, certainly her suicide um, was a mystery. Um, there were there were rumors about her having a drinking problem, and she did. She she was um, it was like the the secret everybody knew was that Liddell Allen had a drinking problem. And and over the years, people speculated as to why she might have committed suicide, and and. And a lot of the theories really didn't seem very plausible, didn't hold much water, uh, things about you know, her husband leaving her. But she had been divorced for over 20 years, and so I never thought it was very plausible that she would commit suicide after being divorced for 20 years, not because her husband had left her. Um, her her son died in January of 1944, um, which of course was a devastating experience for her. Um, he was a young man, 28 years old, uh, and and that seemed a little more plausible. But again, there was almost a five year gap there between his death and and her taking her own life, and so again, and and from the way she. She conducted herself publicly. It seemed that she had had handled um, her son's death as, as well as anybody could. Um, but but again, there was that gap of time. Uh, I had an elderly man who was like ninety some years old, and he said, well, "I know what it was. She had this soldier boyfriend who left her when the war ended, and and indeed she she had a an." A, uh, a relationship during World War II with a um, an American soldier who was a guard at the Italian prisoner of war camp here in Monticello. And when World War II ended in 1945, he he left, and and that was the end of of that wartime romance. But again, there was a pretty significant gap of time, about three and a half years. So, so nobody really knew why she had, she had committed suicide until um, one summer morning, one Saturday morning in August of 2009. We'd been in the house for a couple of years. I woke up um, and immediately felt a compulsion to go to the attic. I, I really didn't understand the compulsion to go to the attic, but it was like a voice in my head telling me that I needed to go to the attic because I was going to find something. 
Um, I resisted the compulsion because it was it was a brutally hot <laughs> August morning for one thing, and the attic um, would be incredibly hot. Um, and and for another thing, when we had first moved into the house, I had scoured the attic for artifacts, and I had found a lot of interesting little things, lots of things that belonged to the Allen family, lots of things that were a hundred years old or or even older. And and I really thought that I had found everything there was to find in the attic anyway. So I really couldn't imagine finding anything. But it was really an, an uncanny compulsion. And I and I thought, well, you know, was I dreaming about the attic or something when I woke up <laughs> or, or what? Uh, but anyway, this, this compulsion nagged at me. I, I, I went downstairs and I ate breakfast and all through breakfast, <laughs> I, I kept feeling this need. Oh, I gotta go to the attic. And finally, I'd been up maybe 30, 20 or 30 minutes and I found myself just going up to the attic. Um, and when I got to the attic, I didn't wander around. I walked directly over to the edge of the south turret room, which is a little round room in the attic. I walked to the edge of it, and I found myself looking down at a, a little gap in the floor, about a two and a half inch gap in the floor. And there are several gaps in the floor because it's not a complete floor; it's an attic floor, and and there, are, you know, heating and air vents and, and and old gas pipes and old electrical wires, all sorts of things. Um, running across the floor and inside the floor and, and so as I said it's not a complete floor anyways um, I had I had glanced down at that gap um, there in the floor at the entrance to the south turret room many times um, and, and never seen anything never noticed anything never gave it a whole lot of thought but I found myself standing there looking down at this gap in the floor um, and, and again, it was as though um, there was a voice in my head telling me to take a closer look. And so I got down on my knees and I peered into the, um, the opening in the floor. And at first I didn't see anything. And as I kept looking, I noticed what appeared to be just a old brown piece of paper. And my first thought was that it was old butcher paper. That was what, what it looked like was, you know, that, that brown paper that butchers use to wrap meat up in. And then right after that, I thought, well, no, it's probably old newspaper because there are a lot of old newspapers in the attic. And it's probably just a scrap of old newspaper that had turned brown with age. In any case, I, I, I got a couple of fingers into the gap in the floor and, and got got hold of the brown piece of paper and, and pulled on it. And to my surprise, it was an envelope, an old brown envelope. And inside this old brown envelope were smaller white envelopes. And they were stamped. They had three cent stamps on them. And they were postmarked. October 1948, and there were letters inside these white envelopes, and I, I, I pulled out one of the letters, and the salutation was dearest, and it was signed love, and then under the word love was just the initial P, and, I, and, and these envelopes were all addressed to Liddell. And I realized that this was a love letter written to Liddell a couple of months before she committed suicide. And so I ran downstairs, I got a claw hammer, I ran back up to the attic, I pried up the floorboard, and there under the floor were 82 letters from 1948 that Liddell had hidden under the floor. And, um, and most of the letters were from a man named Prentice Hemingway Savage, couldn't have a better name for a love story, could you? Yeah. <laughs> and he was um, um, he was a vice president with Texaco Oil. He had grown up in Monticello, and he and Liddell had known each other as children and young adults, and they had even dated as as young adults um, before he left town and began his career in the oil industry. They didn't see each other for 35 years until the spring of 1948. In March 1948, Prentice was in Monticello visiting, visiting his elderly mother, and somebody invited him to go to the horse races in Hot Springs along with 
some other Montefalonians. And and he said, well, sure, I'd like that. And he said, where, you know, where are we meeting? We're all going up in a caravan to Hot Springs. And he was told that everybody was going to meet up at the Allen House. And so um, he got to see Liddell for the first time in 35 years. And he and Liddell went together uh, with these other folks to, to Hot Springs to the horse races. And they shared a raccoon dinner at the track restaurant. And apparently the the sparks of their youthful romance were still warm um, because when he got back home to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he he was in a Texaco oil executive, and he had lived there in Minneapolis for about 20 years at that time, um, the, his his first Saturday back, he went into his secretary's office and used her typewriter to type Liddell a letter to tell her how much he enjoyed seeing her. And and then she wrote him back right away and thus began their correspondence. And very quickly, they started trying to figure out how they could get together, how they might um, meet up somewhere because he traveled a lot in business and she traveled a lot going shopping. Um, she was, after all, the the daughter of a wealthy entrepreneur and, and and she liked to travel. She had friends all over the country and they talked about meeting up in Chicago or New York or St. Louis or Louisville. Um, and and very quickly they're they're flirting in the letters. Um, I remember the the day I found the letters. I, I said and I I arranged the letters chronologically by dates, and I sat there in the hot attic reading these letters in chronological order. And it was really a poignant experience for me um, to to read them flirting back and forth uh, in these early letters and seeing the evolution of their romance because I knew how the story was going to end. Um, they did get together in late June and most of July of 1948. Liddell um, came up with a story about wanting to visit a friend's mother who lived in Stillwater, Minnesota. Um, and she, she had a friend named Mary, and Mary's mother lived in Stillwater, Minnesota, and Liddell decided she wanted to meet Mary's mother, and this was her ruse to go see Prentice. And so she took the train up to, to Minnesota, and she and Prentice spent about three weeks cruising around in his Cadillac, visiting tourist sites and lodges and all throughout Minnesota, Wisconsin, parts of Canada. And then um, he left her at the train station in Milwaukee on his birthday in, in late July. And by that point, they were madly, passionately in love with each other and promising to be together for the rest of their lives. Um, it wasn't a problem for Liddell because she had been divorced for 20 years. Um, it was a problem for Prentice because he was married. Um, in any case, Liddell returned to Monticello at the end of July 1948, happier than she'd probably been her entire adult life. And um, and she started writing to friends, and, and among the letters I found were letters from these three friends of hers, confidants, in whom she confided about the, the affair. And, um, and, and she was pretty pretty certain that Prentice was going to follow through with his promise of leaving his wife and to his credit he did broach the subject of divorce with his wife as soon as he got back home she was used to him being gone a lot because he traveled so much in business and so that's how he got away with being gone with Liddell for so long um, but his the first night back um, he and his wife stayed up all night and talking about divorce yeah, mainly him talking about divorce he, he said in his letter to Liddell that morning that his wife really didn't have have much to say because she was stunned. She didn't understand. Of course, he wasn't going to tell her why he wanted the divorce. He just had these nebulous um, all reasons, you know, about how well they really didn't have much in common and they had grown apart and that sort of thing. After his wife 
had the opportunity to think about it for a couple of days and talk to an attorney, she decided she didn't want a divorce. And that's when the trouble really began because Prentice wasn't going to get his quick, easy divorce that he told Liddell he would get. And so things started dragging out. Um, but one of the things that Liddell and Prentice talked about a great deal um, throughout the, the rest of the summer and, and the fall was how they would be together by Christmas. That Prentice would surely be free by Christmas and he would come to Monticello and they would be spending the holidays together. As it turned out, however, Prentice wrote to Liddell in early December telling her that he didn't think he was ever going to be able to leave his wife. That it was more complicated, more difficult than he had thought. And the letters following that from Prentice were letters from her friends in whom she had confided. And, and her friends were ill-equipped to comfort her. They didn't know what to say to her. One friend said, well, I was afraid something like this was going to happen. Another friend, who, who was Prentice's half-sister, by the way, said, well, if things don't work out between you and Prentice, I hope we can still be friends. And then another one of her friends um, said, well, you really shouldn't, you know, feel sorry for yourself. You should just have faith. Uh, and and so on Christmas Eve, Liddell um, went to her, went to the post office downtown in the square, checked her her post office box, um, found no letter from Prentice. It had been a while. Um, he he'd gone to New York City on a business trip. He had said in his last letter that he didn't know when he would be able to write again. Um, after she went to the post office, she went to the drugstore where she normally went to to read her letters um, and drink coffee. On on this particular occasion, um, she purchased mercury cyanide tablets from the pharmacist. Um, it was a mercury cyanide tablets were a, a common treatment for topical sores at that time. You would take the tablet and rub it on a, mm -hmm. on your skin, and the pharmacist will tell you, you know, don't don't swallow these, <laughs> you know, don't don't get them close to your mouth. It's it's mercury and it's cyanide. Um, sure. And then I I think I think um, Liddell attended the uh, you know. Um, was was hoping that Princess would surprise her uh, at the Christmas party. I think she she waited, um, hoping that that Princess would show up because they had talked about that in their letters about him him being there. Um, and late in the evening, when he didn't show up, she went upstairs and took the mercury cyanide tablets. Wow. And so, with my discovery of the letters, the mystery as to her suicide was solved. A special thank you to my guest today, Mark Spencer, for sharing his stories and accounts of his home, The Allen House. To find out more about his book, you can visit allenhousemonticello.com, and you can also find out more about tours and events at The Allen House. That wraps up today's episode of The Grave Talks. If you like the program, please press subscribe. We could not do the show without your support. So whatever platform it is, press subscribe on it and uh, don't miss any episodes of our program as we release them. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform it is you listen to us on as well. That helps us tremendously as well. Until next time, for The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.